What are the differences between a 510K and a Genovo? Most people think it's time and money. However, that conclusion is based upon one very important assumption, that the Genovo will require clinical data and the 510K won't. But that assumption isn't always correct. 10 to 15% of 510Ks require clinical data, while last year we submitted three Genovos that didn't require any clinical data. In fact, in a pre-sub before we submitted for each of those de novos, the FDA agreed you don't need to provide clinical data for this indication. So what does the FDA require that's different for a de novo versus a 510K all the time? What are the absolute differences? We even use the same template. We use an FDA eStar template, and at the beginning of the template, there's a 510K button and a de novo button. When you click on that de novo button, it pre-populates with the requirements for format and content of a de novo. And there are four differences. Number one requirement. There's a text box right after device description that asks for alternate practices and procedures. They want you to identify if you aren't going to use your device to treat or diagnose, what are your alternatives? So that's one requirement. Number two, there's a classification section. In the classification section, they say, um, what is the medical specialty? What is the proposed classification, one or two? What is your justification for why it should be one or two? And what efforts did you go through to try to identify an appropriate product classification that already exists? So that's what you have to provide in the classification section because you can't use an existing three-letter product code. The whole point of a de novo, they're going to create a new one just for you. The third requirement that's different for a de novo is a benefit risk analysis. The FDA requires a benefit risk analysis to be included in your submission. They give you a guidance document that explains what should be in a benefit risk analysis. We even have a template for one. There's even examples in 24971 on how to do a benefit risk analysis. So that's one of the things you'll have to prepare. You always start with your benefits first, and then you identify your risks, and you have to quantify them, and it really helps if you have some clinical data. <coughs> the fourth requirement is special controls. You have to identify special controls for this new product classification that you've created. So the FDA has a table that they put in every, in every de novo submission. It has two columns. The first column is the risk to health. So what are the risks to health of your device if they use it? Number two, what are the mitigations to try to reduce those risks? The FDA wants a table that provides a third column. Where can we find in your submission the supporting data for the risk mitigation or reduction? In that special control, for that special controls that you're gonna give the FDA, every single special control you identify has to match up with one of the mitigations. You can't have a mitigation with no special control. You can't have a special control with no mitigation. So you're going to create this table and you can use other de novos to help you identify appropriate um, examples of mitigations, appropriate examples of risk to health, but you're going to have to create that table, provide it to the FDA, and then list down below what your special controls are. In the benefit risk section, that's right in between those two items. So those are the four differences between a 510K and a de novo. Only those four things show up in a de novo submission. I hope this was helpful to you if you didn't know what was included in a de novo. And if you liked it, please uh, share it with other people down below. And please visit the link in our blog, link in the description below to our blog that describes more in more detail and provides screen captures what the differences are between a 510K and a de novo. Have a great day. Bye-bye.